In this week's episode of the Nature Journal Show, I'm going to do something a little bit different because I am going back to the neighborhood where I grew up as a kid and had some of my first nature experiences and I haven't been there in decades. So in this week's episode, I'm going to show you how to nature journal where you grew up. Tecolote Canyon in San Diego. Tecolote is a Nahuatl word for owl. And this is literally where I first fell in love with nature as a kid. And today I just wanted to come out here, kind of show some respect, kind of reconnect, take, take a little trip down memory lane and show you a little bit of a more kind of like, I would say emotional type of nature journaling. I don't talk about this that much, but I think that you know, these places where we first connected to nature when we were a kid or we first connected to people that we loved, they're important. And nature journaling is such a great tool and such a good self-awareness tool in addition to just being a great scientific and artistic tool. And so I think it's the perfect thing um, to use in this kind of a situation and a lot of us these days in the modern world we move so much and we're often separated from the places where we grew up and sometimes we just forget about them sometimes we intentionally um, disconnect from them because there could be pain there or vulnerability so I just want to take you along um, with me on this experience and you can see um, this is a you know, Southern California chaparral environment. It's not that far from the ocean. The ocean's not too far over that mesa that way. Um, of course, there's a lot of human impact here. These roads are set up primarily for um, the maintenance on these power lines. And the um, chaparral here, the brush looks pretty boring but there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here lots of california buckwheat species and as you get down into some of these other areas um there's some cool stuff to check out so i used to come out here on my bike as a kid and explore um, walking around i don't really remember the trails very much but we'll see maybe we'll get a little bit lost while i'm out here so there's a golf course back there and in this canyon the golf course is basically usurped the entire riparian area so a lot of the cool resources and plant communities and essential habitat of this ecosystem and this watershed is all contained within there um, and i remember as a kid definitely trespassing onto there and on there and you know golf courses are really hard on the environment in a lot of ways and um, in this case, they're in that whole riparian area, which is the most sensitive habitat and also the most important and essential in such a dry environment, you know? And all of the fertilizers can go into the, right into the creek there and um, definitely a big impact. There's a really cool flycatcher. I'm not totally sure what species that is, but um, it's one of those cool subtropical, maybe it's one of those tropical migrants, but really cool flycatcher. I love flycatchers to this day. When I was a kid though, I didn't know about birds that much. I, I knew like red-tailed hawks and stuff like that, but like that flycatcher, I didn't really appreciate those kind of things that much because I didn't know that much about them. And I think that's one of those interesting things is um, oh, I love those today though, but it's one of those interesting things is, is knowing more about something can help you appreciate it more. And I definitely had, um, people that got me excited about nature and I know my dad definitely played a role, but he wasn't like a bird or anything. And I didn't learn about some of these things in that much detail, um, until a lot later, like in college and knowing about things can sometimes help you appreciate them more like a lot of people in the nature journaling community and some of these nature connection communities talk about how knowing the names of things can put a barrier in between you and those things in nature and noticing but sometimes knowing about things actually does help you connect with them more so a lot of what looks like coyote scat here this would be a cool thing 
to nature journal. I'm still just kind of moving and exploring a little bit more. I haven't pulled out my journal yet. So um, if you're doing something similar to me and kind of exploring one, a, a nature place where you grew up as a kid, um, you're going to have to find the balance between exploring and seeing and feeling the place and actually pulling out your nature journal and nature journaling. Um, that's something that balance is something I've talked about before, so I won't go too much into depth with it here, but right now I'm just going to get a little bit more movement in kind of get a little bit of a survey of the place before I actually pull out my nature journal. Here are some cool San Diego Canyon plants. Um, this right here is a type of astragalus, I believe. So in the bean family, you can tell these um, pinnate leaves are usually a good indicator, even though leaves aren't the most helpful. Um, these flowers are just getting started, but you can already get the feeling for a pea family, Fabaceae bean family, um, gestalt from these flowers, but the leaves um, are a helpful giveaway. This is a cool one. Um, this, I can't remember if this is invasive from South America, but this is a tobacco, so it's in the Solanaceae, um, fused petals. Hopefully you've seen my video, How to Nature Journal Plant Families, and I talk about this family, and this, this fused into a tube, petals fused into a tube is, is not all the time in that family, a five-part symmetry there, um, but the, the tube is pretty common fused petals and um, yeah this is a species of tobacco I, I don't know off the top of my head which one but this grows in really harsh conditions and freeways and stuff like that but a couple um classic um, San Diego Southern California Canyon plants if you're a nature journaler if you're a nature journaler or you care about nature at all you have to know some tracking because this kind of a wet spot is basically like a newspaper and there's so much information that you can find here about what's been going on when you weren't there so if you're just going for a one-hour hike looking at something like this can give you information about what happened the night before what's been happening for like a week so it rained I think it's been like three days now there's definitely some domestic dog tracks in here look at that really big toenail unclipped toenail really widespread really big I mean that size of that print was way too big for any of our um, the native wild canines and then there's these other interesting marks in here that are very subtle see that and one thing you'll notice there if you did an I notice I wonder it reminds me of with that maybe I should do that one thing you would hopefully notice is that there's all these little scratch marks in the track do you see that so what that means is this animal has hair on the bottom of its feet okay so the main animal that does that and leaves these asymmetrical tracks like that, notice how you couldn't draw a line down the middle. Um, it's very asymmetrical. Here's more over there. Um, that is some type of rabbit. And it looks like there's reptile tracks in here as well. Um, very partial, but that's a nice one. Ooh, I should take some nice photos of that. Oops, I left a little mark myself. See how you can actually see scales on the bottom of that foot. That looks like a lizard to me, probably a fence lizard. Here's another partial. So checking out these tracks and nature journaling them would be a really good idea. There's a small mouse over there. A lot of information in these tracks. Um, you gotta look in these wet spots whenever you find them. So at this point, it's, it's really good to check in with your self-awareness. And what I'm noticing is I keep finding little things, little things, little detailed things that are interesting that would make a good nature journal subject. Um, but then I keep going on looking for something kind of bigger or maybe like a vista or maybe like a feeling um, or maybe just like this desire to keep moving. And the problem is, is sometimes that can be a real thing that you should listen to. And sometimes it's a way of kind of procrastinating and never actually taking the nature journal out. So I think I'm at the point where I just need to find a spot to sit down and nature journal for a bit, collect some of my feelings and even those mental processes or kind of discussions or arguments that are going on in my head between what I should do, get those on the paper, then maybe I'll go back, uh, draw those tracks, draw a couple of those plants. So I'm just gonna find a spot over here, a little bit off the trail by this cactus to sit down and kind of get some metadata 
on the page right next to this choya cactus is probably a great idea maybe i could just sit on the ground right there right on one of these amazingly barbed spines how do you like spiny things you like you like the spiny things could probably do some new uh body modifications with these um let's see how how grabby they are these ones aren't as barbed i can't remember which species of choya this is but yeah definitely maybe i'm okay with cactus because i grew up in a place where there was a lot look there's a little baby one starting to grow um so i'm gonna just sit down right here and um, nature journal a little bit of metadata maybe draw a little bit of this cactus and then go back and get some some details about this natural place um not as wildernessy as i remember from my childhood but definitely one of the nature places that i connected to first if not the very first when i was a kid so this might not be the best place to sit down but i just need to sit down and get some metadata i'm also going to do a nice title which I might just block that in at first to create a space for it and then elaborate on it more when I get home. If you're nature journaling somewhere where you grew up and there's sort of like a emotional connection to that place, there's gonna be a lot of things that are um, harder to show like with drawings. So words are gonna be very important for us and um, a title is a good way to kind of capture some of that. I'll talk about some other techniques, but first I'm just going to block in um, my lettering a little bit here with this Tombow pen. So you can see a nature comic doesn't need to be so intimidating. Look how easy it is just to capture that little action sequence with the flycatcher catching a bug. And that's the kind of thing like you could spend the whole day avoiding pulling out your journal um, and all of these little events like this are passing by and you might not record any of them in your nature journal because you're thinking that it needs to be a bigger production that took me less than 30 seconds and if you just have your nature journal in an accessible place maybe um, you'll get in more of those instead of just walking and walking now what i'm going to do is over here I am going to do some um, just kind of stream of consciousness, almost like poetry, just writing down some sounds, um, some feelings, because um, if you're nature journaling somewhere where you grew up, like I said, there's a lot of your interaction with that place is not visual, it's emotional. And so writing, um, making drawings to represent feelings is a little bit hard um, and harder to interpret. So I'm gonna use words and just kind of get a sort of like cluster going. So I spent a few minutes here just writing in some words and getting a sense of the place um, really quickly. So in the amount of time it took me to do that, it probably would have taken me twice or three times as long to do a landscape ito. Um, so I've got some basic information here um, that I'll read to you. So. Tecolote Canyon, the nature place I first fell in love with, an extension of my backyard. Dry, gray bushes, eroded trails, rounded peach, pink, and gray rocks. Choya cactus, as much as a puntia cactus. The cool flycatcher or kingbird I don't remember from my childhood, but I love so much now. Yellow belly, charismatic laser song. Also the buzzing sound of the power lines. A light breeze, the perfect temperature, hummingbird sound, and a few flies. Not like my other video. Trash in the bushes, ice plant flowing over the tops of the hills where houses and palms create the skyline. So I'm not one of the people that, I don't use words that much in my nature journaling, but you can see just how powerful they are. So if you don't use them that much, um, try doing it more. How powerful and how fast. So you can create a sense of place really really quickly and you can capture i didn't get that much into my feelings in this one but um the feelings come with the words and you can really capture a lot quickly with words so definitely practice that um 
And you'll remember that in nature journaling, there's three languages. So I've got um, images, words, and numbers that I should try to incorporate all um, in some way. So I think next what I can do is either find a spot to do a little landscape pito, um, and including the urban elements. So a lot of times we shy away from including, um, you know, the power lines or or whatever, or we don't mention them, or we pretend like the houses and the other people aren't there, and um, we separate those things from nature. And I think it's really important to nature journal all of that. It's important information, and it's a bias that we have, and especially if it's an invisible bias that we don't notice, that's something we want to be careful of. So I might do a, um, a landscape pizza kind of like looking that way and capturing the feel of those power lines. Um, that could be cool. I could do a close up on this cactus. Um, that's another option uh, that would be fun. And I could just go into plant studies would be an easy place to go. Um, so I'm gonna do that and you can see that I've used um, close to about a third of the page here. So if you're thinking about composition, I might wanna split the bottom part into two elements. Actually, this is kind of close to half. So one thing I could do is split this into two elements this way. I think that's what I'm gonna do. And then have these two elements down here. Um, one could be a landscape pizza and one could be some plants. Definitely need to write something about the smell of walking through the chemise. Coyote cologne, some people call it, I think. And just that feeling of kind of exploring as a kid and going off trail a little bit. What were the things that you did in nature where you grew up? I remember trying to eat these as a kid after being out in the canyon for a really long time and getting hungry and they're good, but you can get the glockids, the small spines or hairs are the most problem. The bigger spines are easy to deal with, but I remember getting a ton of those spines like in my lips and uh, going home with all of these um, cactus glockids or what is what they're called um, stuck in my lips. I don't think I was really tuned into this that much as a kid, but now I always look um, under power lines and other poles like that. I always look for pellets and droppings and things like that and there are definitely some major bones right here i think i'm just gonna um draw these real quick um but here are some bones that have come down in pellets uh maybe these are probably owl would be my guess not sure but i would guess owl and a lot of these bones look similar like i'm noticing a lot of um these which to me is um either a femur or what's the one in your arm a humerus um, this would go into the shoulder and this would connect to the rest of the appendage that would have two bones down there, you know, because like in your lower leg. Oh, here's a little um, vertebrae. These are bigger than, um, you know, like a gopher or something. So not totally sure um, what they are. Maybe a squirrel or a rabbit. Um, here's another one. Hmm. What would that be? This might be part of the lower, the lower half of the appendage. See, that would connect like onto there or something. Not totally sure. Haven't been um, brushing up on my bones that much lately. Don't see any skull pieces or anything like that. Um, here's another one of those same ones. So I'm gonna draw some of these. Actually, no, that's a different one. I'm gonna draw some of these bones. Where are the teeth? Not seeing any teeth. Pick up some of these bones here. As far as I know, bird pellets are pretty safe to handle, so I'm not that worried about touching them um, or picking up the bones. If this were another type of scat, oh, speaking of an, another type of scat, I just saw one. If they were another type of scat, carnivore scat, um, see, pellets are not scat, it's what they regurgitate. So I'm not too worried about touching those. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just draw these simple bones right here and try to just keep this collection going on my paper and not let these little bits um, just get kind of neglected because it's really easy to just end up walking around or waiting for waiting for something better to draw something better to draw and in that way just kind of procrastinating doing any drawing at all oh first sign of raptor so far i haven't seen any yet but i just heard 
and I think I see it now, a red, red-tailed hawk, which is the main raptor I remember as a kid. That's pretty much like the only bird that I knew about. <laughs> oh shoot, just dropped my bones. Hopefully I won't get pooped on by like a bird. There's no bird sitting up in, in this tree, uh, this tree. There's no bird sitting up in this uh, power, on this power line right now, so I'm not too worried about it. Let me just capture kind of like a feeling of these bones here. Oh, you know what I could do is I could draw a diagram of the, um, great idea, Marley. I'm gonna draw a diagram of the um, power line with a person standing under it. So diagrams are good because you can do them fast. So I'm just gonna like, boom, boom, boom. Doo, doo, doo. There's the ground, the trail. All right, trail. All right, trail in gray. Trail. Person standing here with a hat on. I like drawing people with hats on because they're more easily recognizable as a person. Um, and then I'll draw an arrow coming to the scat. One thing at a time, Marley. Jeez, dude. Or maybe I'll make the person kind of poke, pointing. There we go. Um, pointing. And then I'll put like a, keep dropping these bones to show you. Put like a thought bubble. That's perfect. And then I can do like a bigger thought bubble here and write a whole bunch of stuff. I could do an I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of inside of that thought bubble. That would be very original. Oh, uh, let's see, power line. I'm noticing a lot of emotion coming up for me. I haven't been writing it down on paper, but I have this sort of like sadness or kind of nostalgia maybe it's just nostalgia of coming back to this place that I moved away from when I was like nine years old and never came back to maybe it's that maybe there's like grief around that maybe it's around like what's been going on for me lately it's been a really crazy year with COVID and everything and also went through like really challenging end of a relationship a uh, romantic relationship and so sometimes like all of those things can affect our nature journaling and just being aware of them or even having a place on the page where you can get those out um, in what I call venting doing some venting on the side of the page um, you can make like a little bubble for it and just by getting that out if you want do it on a separate piece of paper if you're afraid of having that on your journal page but by getting that out and onto paper it helps clear clear your mind a little bit and um, without like suppressing those things that you're having come up inside of you. Um, so I wonder why, so when you do an I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, of course, you start with I notice, your observations, and then you can put what you wonder, which are your questions. Um, so one thing I might wonder in this example is, um, I wonder uh, why there's no, no skulls or teeth. Okay, now that I got that there, I'll just draw some bones right down here. Use the black for that, which is kind of weird to draw bones with a black pen, but hey, can't draw with a white pen on white paper now, can you? So I'm gonna do these to actual size. I mean, you could practically just trace these if you wanted to. It wouldn't come out perfectly, but you would get the basics of it. Or if you're just, you know, working with a little kid or having sort of a rough day, not much energy, you could just trace these and at, le at least you would get something on your paper. I'm trying to do actual size here. Ooh, that one's a little bit too small. So I'm gonna write actual size here. Let me draw this broken one first though. Look, this one has that hole in it too, but it's filled with dirt. Hole is on the smaller side. So that looks to me like it's the same kind of bone. So I'll put that next to the, the other one and draw in the same orientation so that I know it's a second version of the same thing. Not worrying about making these perfect. Maybe I'll just do a dotted. I hear the golfers yelling down there. Bones, okay, I should put a title here so I know what's what these are. If your drawing's not that great or you can't tell what it is just from the drawing, then you use words, duh. 
right? Bones. Ah, uh, and why is this coming out so light now? I'm having issues with my pins today. Oh yeah, that's not the one I wanted. My brush pins misbehaving today. Okay, it's not my most beautiful nature journal page ever, but I'm at least getting some information. Maybe I'll add some more bones on here. Sometimes if your page is not looking that great, just work on the cumulative effect and just keep filling it, like fill every little corner with little drawings and just focus on the little drawings and just filling the page and the page will end up looking better anyways. I'm gonna find some more bones here to draw. I'm noticing what looks like a gray fox track on the ground, which is cool. These bones are really broken up, so I might not pick them up and move them. I might just try to draw them in place. Um, I see another one of these ones I think is like a hip bone, so I'm going to draw that. Oh, and here's that weird, um, so look at that. There's a poop here. There's a scat here that's almost 100%. Um, it looks like yellow jacket. Um, can you see that? It looks like yellow jacket um, carapaces, or I don't know if yellow jackets technically, yellow jacket exoskeletons, you see that? So there are a lot of things that dig up yellow jackets and eat them. Um, the main thing I think of that poops out yellow jackets is um, skunks. All right, so I'm gonna just keep drawing these bones um, right here. Maybe I'll just explore here a little bit more um, and see if I can find anything else, like a vertebrae it would be cool to draw. Ooh, something got moved right there, that's weird. Um, there's this, this scat that's mostly hair, probably coyote um, marking this spot. Let's see what else, always look under, um, Perches like this, posts, things like that are really important. Still don't see any teeth. Um, so recording the absence of information or the absence of sign is sign. So the absence of information is still information and a lot of times we don't think of it that way. We only record the things we see and we don't record the things we don't see. So like for example, if you don't see any um, hawks or like no vultures, I'm gonna write that down. Um, it's important to record things you don't see and we usually don't do that and there's definitely some you know research uh, issues or sort of data from a data standpoint it's kind of a weird thing but um, if you don't see any turkey vultures that's probably an important thing to write down um, and there's some assumptions built into it but it's still um, useful information because if I don't write that down um, and I don't write down that I see turkey vultures then I don't really know which one it was you know what I'm saying um, so I'm gonna write down a couple of things that I don't see um, no turkey vultures no kestrels I haven't seen any kestrels I haven't seen any lizards either which is surprising to me um, maybe I'll see some later. No lizards. I saw lizard tracks. No snakes. Um, what else is kind of surprising that I haven't seen? Um, not as much Apuntia as I thought. So the prickly pear. Um, I'm starting to build a page here. It's not looking aesthetically that great. But I'm not going to let that stop me right now because my goal today was to nature journal where I grew up. My goal wasn't to create a beautiful page, or at least that's what I told myself. So maybe I had the hidden goal that I wanted to create this beautiful page so I could share it on Instagram and get a ton of likes. Um, but trying to make your goals intentional and conscious and remember um, when things aren't working out or you start feeling weird or you start feeling disappointed with the way things are going, reflect like, what was my actual goal? Am I, am I achieving that? Yes, I'm achieving it, yay. And the other good thing is that I didn't just keep walking and walking and walking and walking, waiting for a place to nature journal and then maybe pooping out completely. So I haven't done that, I haven't failed. Um, so I'm gonna keep going. Um, not as much Apuntia as I thought. What else have I not seen? Um, nothing really flower, not, not many things flowering. 
I guess I could go trespassing on the golf course and go nature journal down there. Just might get hit by a golf ball if I'm not careful. Okay, so um, I wrote a couple things in there that I haven't seen. Um, so getting that information of what's not there, not present. And you can see my layout's not the greatest, um, but it's still kind of divided into three. There's something going on. I'm gonna just keep filling the page with more stuff. Maybe I'll go sketch some plants real quick. Wow, I just said that I hadn't seen any flowers, but look at this crazy, and I think this is probably an invasive species. Um, it looks like the chicory tribe of the Asteraceae, but look at this plant is like, everything is here is totally dry and gray, and then you come in here and look at that um, little white, almost like purplish flower, and you can see, um, see the dentate margin on the petal there. Um, that to me is an indicator that reminds me of the chicories um, and the dandelions. I don't know which one this is, but I really do like those, even though most of them are non-native in California. Here's another interesting, look at over here, how this, whoa, those, those birds are so cool. Oh man, I really love these, some type of flycatcher, so cool. Um, but look at how this plant stands out over here. Everything is so dry, so dry. Ooh, that looks like some mugwort there. So dry. Lots of these non-native annuals grow really fast and then dry out. And then look at this. I think this is non-native here too, but that's um, whorehound. That stuff is planted a lot as like a medicinal herb. And then look at this. Some species of um, California buckwheat right there. Oh, there's one flowering. Okay, cool. This one still has fresh flowers on it, see? So they're not very showy, but they're in these umbels, these clusters, these inflorescences. Um, if you don't know what an inflorescence is yet, then um, I failed as an educator. Ooh, and then look at this, this is really cool. There's stuff germinating all down here. This is something you can nature journal, the tiny worlds. Um, it's really cool, there's a lot of information to be seen in these small things and uh, really excited to be interviewing Rosalie Hazlett coming up in an upcoming live episode and she did a whole class on nature journaling tiny world so I wonder what kind of stuff she would find out here maybe she would nature journal this um, she did that whole class on um, nature journaling tiny worlds and just how there's so much information and so much cool texture and color when you start zooming in and um, even in a place that seems pretty bleak and gray, um, if you zoom in, you can find stuff like that to Nature Journal. So, oh yeah, here comes the red-tailed hawk. Oh, sweet. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Rad. So that was short but sweet. That red-tailed hawk um, flew right by and I was like, had my Nature Journal already put away but just whipped it out and got at least a quick sketch of it in there. Also showing the way the tail was um, tilted in a really cool way. So even those short moments, just trying to capture those. So making it as easy as possible to pull, your nature journal needs to be really easy to pull out of your bag. The harder it is to pull your nature journal out, the less you're gonna nature journal. So make sure um, that it's not that hard. And I call that friction. The more friction there is, um, between you and your nature journal and your supplies, the more um, straps, zippers, Velcro, all of that stuff is a problem. And if you're wearing a backpack and have a nature journal in the bottom of your backpack with your lunch and stuff on top of it, that's just not gonna work. Oh, sweet, here's another flower that's blooming and one of my favorite animals, favorite kinds of animals or categories is like, look at this metallic green bee in there. That is so cool. Love those. So this is obviously in the Asteraceae, right? In the sunflower tribe. And these are an amazing plant. Even in such a drought and in such harsh conditions, they're flowering. Um, really, really cool. And love that bee. Also, check this out. This must be a Euphorbiaceae. So I talked about these in that succulent video, but look at how this is flowering. It's so crazy. So if you make the effort to come out nature journal in the place where you grew up you might wonder like what are you looking for is there something like you're looking for and you know it goes through, going through the trouble and hiking around and this kind of stuff it's like you know what is the point or is there like a goal to this oh dang what oh my gosh yes 
awesome barrel cactus with old flowers on it. So, so cool. Yes. If you haven't already, I would definitely recommend um, reading some Joseph Campbell. And he talks about like the hero's journey. And I think sometimes you have to go back to where you started or at least look at where you started um, to keep going further. Look at these awesome cactuses here. You can see the little pups coming off the side. So I'm on the south facing slope right now and there's just so much more cactus over here. There's just choya cactus everywhere. And I've been seeing these barrel cacti, um, the barrel cactus for the first time. There's some Apuntia, even more choya up there. Maybe I shouldn't have worn sandals and shorts, but I'm hoping like ever since I was a kid, like I loved reptiles, loved them so much. And if I could, this might be the place um, to try to find some. And I know like my first experiences with cool reptiles were in this area. Um, and there was this guy in the neighborhood. I remember when I was a kid, there's this guy, I think he was from somewhere in the South and he would go out and just kill rattlesnakes. Like it was his job in the Canyon. And that's definitely messed up. And at that time I already, you know, loved snakes enough that I didn't think that someone should just be going out and killing them. And that there's even with poisonous snakes that they serve a purpose and that they have a right to exist as much as humans do if anything so that was kind of a crazy that guy's name was pappy and he would go out this big he had this like special pole and everything and i think he would take a buck and he would just go out and kill as many rattlesnakes as he could find um, and bring them back to his house and like skin them or something um just for like the good of mankind or whatever so sort of an old school way of looking at nature and it's interesting to think you know like was that his like form of connecting with nature and like what if he had learned about nature journaling when he was a kid you know um would things have been different would hundreds of rattlesnakes still be alive today some of those rattlesnakes probably would have outlived him i'm sure he's passed by now um, check out this. Here's another important plant that I should talk about while I'm here. Please, rattlesnakes, I'm your friend, okay? I'm not pappy. I'm not pappy. Check this out. This is an awesome example of this plant. A lot of times it's way smaller than this. This is probably a really old one. This is so cool. What was that down there? This is... This is, I'm not sure if this is Rus larina, but this is in the genus Rus. And some of these are called lemonade berry. I think this is lemonade berry. Really cool. I think it's in the Anacardiaceae, so the poison oak family. Um, poison oak used to be put in the same genus as this plant. It looks like things have been chewing on it down here. See how there's this like regrowth right there? That would be a fun thing to nature journal. And look at all this lichen, really cool lichen and regrowth on these little buds. This is a nice old one. And this is the kind of habitat that's so important and, and, and so hard to replace in these, um, you know, these dry climates like San Diego. Oh, I think I see a different kind of cactus. Oh no, it's just a, oh, what bird was that? Oh, oh man, this is so cool. Yeah, so this, this is the kind of plant that is hard to replace. And you know, it provides so much importance for habitat birds landing here and stuff so I think I'm gonna chill here for a little bit and nature journal this really cool lemonade berry then explore up more into the cactus all right I was here and I was just sitting for a while enjoying being in this place and then I started thinking well I came here to nature journal then I started thinking about this question that I have and some people have pointed out that maybe nature journaling is kind of putting something in between you and the direct experience of nature and that when you're nature journaling you're like looking at things and thinking about how you're going to interpret them onto your paper then you're looking at your paper and that attention is actually not on just being there in the experience um so anyways i was sitting here for a moment um without my nature journal not nature journaling just being here in the experience and i started thinking about that question and realized that a lot of times when i'm just being in the experience of being in nature my mind's actually wandering and i'm actually thinking about things that aren't nature that i'm supposed to be in that direct um, being there experience that some people talk about um so 
I decided I'm gonna pull out my nature journal because actually I'm gonna question that concept altogether and 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 argue in fact that you know when you're nature journaling you're reminding yourself and you have a tool to keep reminding yourself of being there in that experience with nature and seeing those things and noticing them and asking questions about them whereas when we're just kind of walking around or just sitting in nature even I think the majority of us are actually probably just mind wandering like over 50% of the time thinking about things other than what's going on in that spot in nature so I'm just gonna challenge that um, I, and I know people have mentioned that and I know that is, is a thought that I've had, but I'm just gonna question that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to nature journal some of this um, this cool lichen and cool texture on um, this branch here because it's just so interesting all over this branch. And some people would probably make this look really easy, but it's actually a challenging subject to draw. So I have a couple options. This is not something that's really easy to simplify because it's actually the complexity of the texture that's one of the most um, aesthetically interesting things about it. So what I'm gonna do, what I have to do instead is just zoom in on a really small area and I could probably even use my viewfinder for that. Let me use my little one. Um, so I can use my plastic viewfinder to help me be really disciplined about just zooming in on a really small um, area because if I choose anything too big, it's going to be almost impossible to draw. So by using this viewfinder, I can um, force myself to, geez, that's almost too big and even that's almost too big. I could like include um, this little bit of a sprout there, um, maybe make that smaller um can't make it any smaller actually so i could do that sprout with a little bit of lichen a little bit of that branch that would be an example of what i could do another place i could just focus in on is like over here this zone would be really interesting so i'm going to choose a spot um using my viewfinder Ooh, this could be good there's a hole right there i wonder if i could just get the um if i could get the viewfinder to stay in place the wind might blow it, but check that out. That is so cool. I just invented that. Actually, someone else has probably done it, but look at how the viewfinder can just sit there. There's a little bit of a glare or reflection, which is kind of annoying, but I can get the basics of my drawing. Um, so first thing I'm gonna do is create that square on my paper. Sometimes I do this with gray, but I think right now I'm just gonna use it with black. Um, do it with black ink. Do, do, do. I'm actually drawing while looking through the camera. That's probably bad idea and just in case you were wondering about my advanced recording equipment I'm just using an old iPhone 8 um, for all of my recording okay so I've got that and I've got that boom boom, boom. so the colors are kind of subtle in there but I'm just gonna exaggerate them to make them easy but first thing I'm gonna do is get in the basic composition so I see there's a place here where the branch actually ends and there's a little bit of sky behind it that's great from a compositional perspective then the next most important thing is probably this whole bit here where the bark is totally off so it's near um, the halfway point so I'm just gonna start it here it's kind of jagged comes up and around here across it might be a little bit closer to that edge than I depict it but that's fine so then it comes up here and this is almost on the edge there's a little bit of this thing with the weird sprouty stuff then this comes back and it looks like there's a, a second bump here that exits the frame right there um, and then uh, there's even a little bit of like a healing part there, but then this is all rough here There's a hole in the second layer of bark that goes almost all the way across to there So let's get that coming across right here uh, I'm trying to get these proportions in kind of right this comes across here now I'm gonna start thinking about value already because I'm noticing this is a really dark spot So I'm actually gonna even though there's like this leaf caught in that part there I think I'm gonna simplify that and just go boom put in um, sort of like an anchor dark value so by putting this much dark into here it anchors the rest of what's going to be a painting um, to have you know this as the darkest dark um, so my medium dark if this is my darkest dark my medium dark can be pretty dark so um, this prevents you in theory from having anemic watercolor where you are all too light in all of your values um, so that'll be at least my darkest one. Let's see if I can put in some other value stuff and also some form stuff. So I'm kind of um, combining form, which is getting the, the three-dimensional feeling, 
volume, I should say, actually, would probably be more accurate, volume and value. So those are probably two of your priorities. So see this kind of marks like this, creating the feel that that's three dimensional, that is working on the volume. Um, whereas putting in this dark is mainly working on the value. Now those two work together, um, and they work together also with perspective, which um, I don't really need to worry about a sense of depth too much in this. If it were a landscape beat though, or like a bigger drawing, I would. Oh my goodness, the wind blew my frame off. I had a feeling that was gonna happen. Now let's see if I can remember. This is the hard part is getting it back in the exact same spot. Shoot. Oh goodness. Oh gosh, I wish I had some tape with me. Now I'm just gonna have to hold this there like that with my hand which is kind of awkward oh, what will i do whatever will i do this nature journaling is turning into a real life or death situation here oh gosh and how can i if there was a way my elbow could bend the other way that would be great right now um or if i could hold my book in a different way okay but once i get the main frame i'll be able to to stop looking but i still need to kind of work some of this stuff out, think about how um, I'm going to create form. This is, I'm going to make this, fictionalize this to be a little bit rounder than it is actually. Um, it is round. Oh gosh, I might totally botch this. This is quite a complex um, sort of uh, texture study and I'm going really fast with it. Sometimes these abstract textures um, they're abstract for a reason, so if you don't render the textures like very accurately, um, then sometimes when people look at it, it doesn't really read like what it's supposed to be. So this is all just like yellow lichen and bark kind of going that way. So I'm going to try to um, kind of pattern that, and hopefully not over pattern it. Um, this, there's a possibility I'm starting to have that feeling of like worry that oh gosh this is just gonna look like a weird collage of colors and lines but you can't really tell that it's a lichen covered branch maybe I overdid it with this black because I'm seeing like way more now that I'm not looking through the plastic the plastic actually simplifies your values a little bit let's see are there any more darks or, or things like that that I could use. There's sort of like these bits in between the um, the bark, give the bark a little more texture. I don't know how I'm gonna come in here with that yellow. That is gonna be a little bit of a challenge, I think. Um, this should be an edge and this should be an edge maybe. Something peeling, peeling bark. There's certain things that are just too complex to, um, too complex or too abstract to pattern them um, or simplify them. Obviously, like a telephone pole is an example of something that you don't need to capture very much detail for it to read. It's very simple. Even a person's silhouette is, is like that. Whereas like bones or fragments of bones or weird abstract pieces of like bark can be harder. So if this, you know, it's not like a bird where you can draw sort of like a cartoonish version and just from that limited amount of information, you get a full picture of what you're what you're looking at. So now I'm gonna start coming in with some of these lichens. So I intentionally, if I were doing this with oil paint or something opaque, that would be um, very easy because I could just add the opaque stuff in like it is in reality. So in reality, you have this underlying branch and then you have things growing on it that are sort of like wrapped around it. So in like an oil painting, you could actually reproduce that, um, that building that organic building on top of, um, of the colors, but you can't do that with ink or with watercolor unless you're using like opaque uh, acrylic um, gouaches or something like that. And at that point, it's basically like acrylic or oil painting. Okay, so I'm gonna come in here um, and I am trying to put these in. I'm definitely patterning these probably more than they are. And I, I could probably do this with color but I don't want to rely on that yellow color for the complete feel of lichen. Um, and there's even some growing on there, but I don't want to do that too much. I want to keep this up, give it a little bit more of that, maybe a little bit more local texture. A lot of times texture and volume are 
at counter purposes. So the more um, texture you put on, sometimes it takes um, away from that sense of volume that is, it's a three dimensional object and um, vice versa. So to get like a strong feeling of volume that it's a three dimensional object, sometimes you have to sacrifice the, the local texture. And this kind of like any branch is the perfect place. Like if you're, it's a perfect place to mess that up. So like if you're trying to draw this tree as a three dimensional object um, and you start including all the texture on the bark, you're gonna lose that feeling um, and uh, that feeling of depth. All right, well, I have a black and white and it's actually surprising, maybe because I set my expectations so low and was afraid that I was gonna ruin it. I actually think it looks way better and almost reads as a black and white. So I might just leave it that way um, and keep this simple black and white page. I wish I had like one crazy skull or something to go in this corner. Um, maybe I could do another distraction bubble or something like that, add something afterwards. Um, if I wanna give myself homework, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't give myself homework. Um, and then a thought bubble will make that gray and then that'll be a pretty good page, you know So I'm stoked about how that came out. Let me make sure I don't leave my plastic frame here And I'm not gonna color it, but I'm gonna put in this gray bubble um, And other than that, you know, I have the title which I will leave that for home and, and probably will do that in color And then that's it for this page. Ooh, that was too close to the hat. And I like the way that this one's facing the opposite way of that one, even though it doesn't necessarily work with like kind of like comics reading directions, not necessarily, but okay, cool. Page complete. I'm gonna explore more. This is the other plant that I really remember the smell of from when I was a kid. And um, this is a salvia and um, sage genus. And it has such a strong smell when you walk through it you can definitely notice it. So just another one of those olfactory associations that I have um, from when I was a kid. That one, the sage and the chemise. Let me see if I can get to the zone. The zone's not very easy. All right, so I just came off. Um, I was off trailing there, did some nature journaling and um, back on the trail and came to another one of these posts and it was just like this is not even the trail but i just came over here um, there's disturbed soil that you can always check out near things like this and there's also like i said bird perching stuff so this right here looks to me like raptor poop uh, i wouldn't be surprised if that's the red tail hawk um, that i just saw recently um, hmm, those are interesting some type of interesting scat right there kind of looks almost like rabbit Anyways, um, so I'm under this other post. I'm gonna look here also, and I'm noticing something that looks like a skull. So it's super cool, don't wanna step on any. Here's some bones that almost looks like egg shells right there. This is definitely part of a skull. Um, or vertebra, maybe? And what's that? That's weird, that looks like a seed. Okay, but check this out. I thought I saw, oh yeah, here we go, look at this. This. this is probably from a really old pellet but look at what's that oh my what the that's got to be part of a skull right it's weird it's asymmetrical um, that's a socket okay and this looks like sinuses is that an eye socket this is looking like a bird skull to me looking like a bird skull um, not gonna go with a 100% certainty on that oh and then look see this is what I'm more used to in the pellets where I live see that those are rodent teeth right there so um like gopher or rat those are big those are big because that's a split one that's not a those aren't two separate ones the split it broke oh dang look at those are fossils oh what look that looks like an imprint fossil a trace fossil right there look at that oh what are you kidding me do you see that oh a fossil dude what look at that that's freaking awesome. See what I said? Disturbed soil next to things like this. Wow. So from a geologic perspective, disturbed soil. Look, there's another fat pellet. That one looks more recent. It's not as broken up. Look at that. That that to me right there, that looks like great horned owl. And then look at look at that right there. That's more like the skulls that I'm used to seeing um, in the pellets where I live. Rodent. Rodent skull for sure. Definitely. 
Look at that. It's the cranium right there in the rostrum. Here's the mandible. Looks like a rat, probably, would be my guess. Dim suburban rats. Oh, okay. Look, there's more, more. And so look how interesting this is. Now this could be a sampling error because I, I only have these two posts, but that last post had no skulls. I, I didn't find any skull pieces. So this would be something that I should definitely, uh, at least nature journal this a little bit. Uh, and see if I can find him. Oh, dang, look, another mandible. Okay, definitely a nature journal here. Oh, look at that one. It looks like it's from someone's lint trap. Look at that, very bluish gray fur. That is a big, big pella right there. So big, so I wonder, see, the thing I could do is I could compare also, I think the other um, power line was like that one, like it had fewer crossbars, and this one has like more crossbars. Yeah, I did. The last one I was at only had one crossbar. Good thing I drew it. <laughs> Besides getting your legs really scratched up, what can you get from going and nature journaling where you grew up? Well, I can just share my experience right now, but from my experience coming here in nature journaling in this canyon where I first connected with nature as a kid um, has been like really cool. And at first I almost didn't get my nature journal out and didn't start filling pages because I was just kind of nostalgically walking around and recognizing things and I probably could have done that for two hours but I'm so glad that I actually um, my willpower kicked in or my habit of nature journaling kicked in um, and my accountability for making this video for the nature journal show but those things all kicked in and I actually did some nature journaling and I think I filled some cool pages. I explored a little bit more and looked deeper at things than if I had just come here, you know, as an adult and um, just walked through the place so superficially as, you know, we usually walk really superficial as adults. And when we're kids, when we grow up in a place, when we grow up in nature, we might not know about, about nature journaling, but we're so full of wonder anyways, just because that that's the natural state of being for a kid. Um, but as you grow up, you start taking things for granted. You start having all of these thoughts and emotions connected to places, to everything, to nature, to being outside. Um, and you probably just walk through the place. Even if you go back to that place where you grew up, you probably walk through it with so much going on in your head that you're not really there and you're definitely not spending the type of attention that you do when you were there as a kid. So like the really cool thing is that I'm having trouble sticking my journal back into my bag. But the really cool thing is, is that nature journaling helps you be in that place where you grew up more like you were when you were a kid. Nature journaling helps you be like a kid. You can spend so much more time in a place um, than you would normally as an adult because you're like, oh, how can I ask questions about this? Oh, what's that? Oh, let me draw this. Oh, let me pay attention to that. And as a kid, you're just in love with everything, seeing it for the first time, that that state comes naturally and you spend time in those places um, for longer and you don't have to be like doing something like walking, running, golfing, um, taking photos frenetically or whatever. You just have fun exploring and like, whoa, what's this? Oh yeah, awesome. And then you just like keep doing cool stuff like that. So nature journaling definitely helped me connect with that. Um, this place, you know, where I grew up as a kid, it, nature journaling definitely made it possible for me to interact with that place more like I did when I was an actual kid. So that's kind of the main takeaway um, I'm getting right now. Um, I highly recommend if you've moved, you know, as an adult and there's somewhere you feel like you really started to learn to love nature, go back there, check it out. Maybe you already have a practice around this um, and maybe you go there regularly, but if you don't, check it out, you know? 
Um, what, what is it like to go back there? How do you feel? How can you use your nature journal to help you connect with that place and learn about yourself? Because, you know, we go out into the world, we do things we explore as humans, we go far, far away from where we started out. And we learn a lot of things on that trip, on that journey, away from where we were born, where we grew up. But it's crazy sometimes how much you can learn when you go back to that place where you first started off, where you come from and realize how much you can learn and how much you can grow by going back, back to that place. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Nature Journal Show. New episodes come out every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. as you know. And I often do live videos with interviews and all kinds of cool stuff, studio stuff, studio techniques. And I often do those on Sunday afternoons. Definitely check out my Instagram if you want to see stuff almost every day, little stuff. And if you want to get even more involved and help me do this, um, collaborate with me, you know, join in on this project that I'm on. And this is my main This is my main job now. This is what I'm doing. I'm bringing nature experiences, nature education to you and helping you see more in nature. And this is a really steep hill I'm walking up right now. But if you're interested in all that, getting deeper, more involved in helping me continue to do this, check out my Patreon page. And I post stuff on there that's for patrons only and for, you know, you can start off at $2, $5, whatever. A month help me make these videos um, super appreciated oh dang did you see that red tail hawk oh. Oh. that's like the only bird that I knew about as a kid literally I thought that was like the only raptor in California oh, yeah yeah